Okay, there's an old song. I want to help it to get stuck in your mind like it's stuck in mine here lately. Uh, a lot of you won't know it, but if you're older like me, you might. Everybody get on your feet. You make me nervous when you're in your seat. Take off your shoes and pat your feet. We're doing a dance that can't be beat. We're barefooting. We're barefooting. <laughs> How many of you ever heard that? Well, okay. I want you to, uh, to get it stuck in your mind because <laughs> the title of my lesson today, and I don't know how I come up with this. Well, I do because my mind works in these crazy ways. The title of my lesson today is Soul Stepping, or Where Does the Soul Go When It Steps Out of the Body? So, um, so now that maybe that song is stuck in your mind like it was stuck in mine, <laughs> Maybe it'll help you remember the study. <laughs> we'll see. Okay. So this, this study is about our soul stepping out of our body at the moment of death. 2 Corinthians 5 verses 1 through 2 and then verse 4 says, For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God and house not made with hands eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house, which is from heaven. This tabernacle, this covering of our soul, it's speaking of our body. The tabernacle Paul talks about is our earthly body. It's our house that we, the real us, lives in while we're on this earth. For we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened, not for that we would be unclothed, and now he's comparing it to our clothes, not that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon, that mortality might be swallowed up of life. So in this verse, our tabernacle or our house is compared to uh, our house or our clothing that our soul is in until we depart this body. Verse 5 goes on to tell us that we have the earnest of the Spirit, and that means we have the down payment of the Holy Spirit already in us. And Paul says, therefore, and, and Jesus came to abide with us forever at the moment we were saved. He tells us that in John chapter 14 that he would do that, and he did. Uh, so then in verse 6, Paul says, Therefore, we are always confident. And because, because of his Spirit in us, we can be confident. Therefore, because we have the earnest of the Spirit. And this is what we're confident of, that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. So this is telling us that to be absent from this body is to be present with the Lord. At the moment of death, the soul steps out of the body. Soul stepping. We're soul stepping. We're all going to soul step one day. <laughs> Examples of a soul stepping out would be Rachel in the Old Testament, Genesis 35, verses 18 through 19. And it came to pass, as her soul was in departing, that she called his name Benoni, and Rachel died and was buried. Rachel died in childbirth, and she was buried. Her body was buried, but her soul had departed as her soul was in departing. Another Old Testament example is found in 1 Kings chapter 17, 17 through 21. The son of the woman Elijah was staying with, fell sick, and there was no breath left in him. And he, Elijah, stretched himself upon the child three times and cried unto the Lord and said, O Lord my God, I pray thee, let this child's soul come into him again. And the voice, uh, the Lord heard the voice of Elijah, and the soul of the child came into him again, and he revived. And Elijah took the child and brought him down out of the chamber into the house and delivered him 
unto his mother, and Elijah said, See, thy son liveth. So Rachel died, and her body was buried, but the child lived again. And uh, there were also uh, many in the New Testament were brought back to life again after their soul had departed their body. But many aren't. Many bodies are buried. We have graveyards to prove it. And that body waits there until the resurrection when it will be made new and be reunited with its soul again. The body of Rachel was buried, but her soul had departed. So the question is, where did these souls go? Where did these Old Testament souls go? We're going to look at that first. The ones before Jesus died went to a place called paradise, a beautiful, beautiful place like the Garden of Eden before Adam sinned. The reason they went there is that they had to wait until the blood of Jesus had been shed. During the Old Testament days, paradise was in the heart of the earth. Uh, it was called paradise. It was also called Sheol in Hebrew and Hades in Greek, which meant the realm of the dead. Don't get that confused with purgatory. There is no such place or thing as purgatory. This was paradise. The animal sacrifices they had made only provided a temporary covering for the sin of the people saved under the Old Testament. Their sins were forgiven but had not been taken away. That's why they went to paradise and not to heaven because their sins had not been taken away, only forgiven. Proof of that, Hebrews 10:4. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sin. Hebrews 10, 11. And every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices, which can never take away sin. Oh, 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 but the blood of Jesus does. It did. The blood of Jesus was the one perfect sacrifice for sins forever. The blood of Jesus paid the price on past, present, and future sin of the whole world. It not only cleanses and covers, His blood takes it away. Hebrews 10.10 10. So by the blood of Jesus, we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus once for all. Verse 12, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, set down on the right hand of God, for by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Part of what Jesus did during the three days and nights that his body was in the grave was to meet those in paradise and take their soulish bodies to the third heaven to the paradise in the third heaven. There they are now awaiting the resurrection at the last day when they'll get their new uncorruptible body. Now, since what the book of Hebrews calls a better way, a better sacrifice has been made, that of Jesus, the Apostle Paul tells us what was revealed to him is that at the very moment of our death, since Jesus died and his blood was shed at the very moment of our death, the soul steps out of the body to be with the Lord. Remember Paul said in, in um, uh, where was that, in, in 2 Corinthians that I read at the, the first, verse 6, while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. He said we'd rather be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. So when the soul steps out of the, the body, we are immediately with Jesus. It is the Lord himself who guides us safely home. He's been with us all the way. Why would he leave us now? He won't. He said, I will never leave you or forsake you. Hebrews 13, 5. Jacob died while he was still in Egypt. I want you to listen to this. The Lord told him in Genesis 28, verse 13 and 14. 
He told Jacob that he was going to give the land that Jacob was lying on right then to him and to his descendants. And thy seed shall be as the dust of the earth, and thou shalt spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And in Genesis twenty-eight fifteen, the Lord said, Behold, I am with thee and will keep thee in all places whither thou goest and will bring thee again into this land, for I will not leave thee until I have done that which I have spoken to thee of. When Jacob died years later, God still hadn't done all that which he had spoken to him of. (laughs) Jacob and his seed have never possessed all the land God promised them. They still only have a little piece of it. And Jacob died down in Egypt. So you know what? Since God had told him, I won't leave you until I have done that which I have spoken to thee of, and he had spoken to him that he and his descendants would own all that land. So that means the Lord was still with him when his soul stepped out of his body, and he is still with Jacob at this very moment. And at the second coming of Jesus, Jacob and his seed are going to possess all that land. Psalms forty-eight fourteen says, For this God is our God forever and ever. He will be our guide even unto death. Psalm seventy-three twenty-four, Thou shalt guide me with thy counsel and afterward receive me to glory. He said, I will never leave you or forsake you. Hebrews 13, 5. That comforts me. That comforts me to know My God is with me all the way. My God is with my loved ones all the way. Whatever they go through, however they die, my God is with them. Death may look very, very bad to us. A lot of times it does. Not everyone can just go peacefully in their sleep. But death doesn't look so bad to God. I want to show you a a, a few little things. This this comes to my mind as... um, something a sweet lady told me, a sweet friend of mine. Her mother was very close to death and her body was struggling to breathe and 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 the mother she appeared so uncomfortable and, and, and struggling and suffering and the doctor watched uh, the daughter watched the nurses and the doctors working with her while they tried to bring her back and um and she did. She said her mother just seemed to be suffering horribly. They brought the mother back, got her breathing stable, and her daughter lovingly said, Mother, Mother, I was so afraid. You looked like you were struggling and suffering, and it was awful. Don't ever do that again. And the mother, the mother responded with, I don't remember any of that. All I remember is a real peaceful feeling. And if it ever happens again, don't let them bring me back. Wow. God was with that lady. God was with that lady. We couldn't see. We couldn't see it. We got a veil over our eyes. And sometimes I wonder if if demons may be hanging around at a person's death thinking they can keep us in that body or something. You know, the devil must really hate to see us go to heaven where he can't go. Um, I, I don't know, <laughs> but but remember Michael, the archangel, and, and that thing that went on with him and Satan about the disputing of the body of Moses? Um, we, we may never know just what was going on there, and uh, I'm just speculating again. I do a lot of that, uh, but it's on my list of things to find out about what, what was happening there. Our soul steps out of our body at the moment of our death. And Jesus guides us safely home. It may look bad on this side and we cry as we see them go, but boy, the angels and the loved ones already in heaven are rejoicing to see them come. And Jesus will guide us safely home. Our bodies later are resurrected when Jesus comes for us in the air at the rapture, 1 Corinthians 15 and 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. You may want to read those sometime. 
At that time, we'll have a new sinless body and many, many verses show us that we will know our loved ones when we see them. Our, and our, our soulish body looks like uh, our body now. Also, there's verses that, that I could go to to show you that. Uh, so until our body is raised, it, it does seem we have a soulish body and one that is also recognized as the person with the personality we have had while on earth. So don't be afraid that you won't know those in heaven that you've loved on earth. Paul told his converts, you're going to be my cause of joy and rejoicing when I get to heaven. How could that be if he didn't recognize them? <laughs> First Thessalonians 2.19, he says, For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? For ye are our glory and joy. He said in 1 Corinthians 13.12, for now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know, even as also I am known. Dr. John R. Rice used to say, do you think we're going to be dumber in heaven than we are on earth? <laughs> no, I think not. Of course, we will know our loved ones in heaven and we will be able to love them so much better and so much more than we ever could have loved them while on earth. We're pretty selfish people. We love ourselves too much to show others the love that they deserve and the love we wish we had showed them after they're gone. We're like, oh, regret, 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 you know. But we're going to have all of eternity to make up for all those times we didn't show our love for them. Um, Paul was confident about all that he told us in his letters. In 2 Corinthians 5, 6 through 8, twice he uses that word confident. Therefore, we are always confident, knowing that while we are at home in the body, we're absent from the Lord. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. And one reason he could be so confident is that he'd been there. He had been to the paradise of God. He had been to the garden of God in the third heaven. And you can read about that in Second Corinthians 12. <clears throat> he went and he came back again and he was never again content <laughs> while on this earth. What a comfort that should be for us. We think it's so good here. But if we only knew, oh, if we only knew, we'd never be content again. And I think that's why God doesn't tell us more about it. Our selfish selves would probably go ahead and kill ourselves to get there and let the rest of the world go to hell. You know, we are left here to point people to Jesus. When the Old Testament souls were transferred to heaven, so was paradise. Paul saw it. I believe paradise in the third heaven is where we'll live until the entire body of Christ gets there after the rapture. The mansions Jesus went to prepare may just be our wedding present that is that uh, are open to us after the marriage. The early Christians were not afraid of death. They embraced the thought of it. The only reason they seemed content to stay on this earth was so that they could point others to Jesus. And you know what? If we were doing what is our job to do, what is our purpose to do, we could be more content while on this earth too. We wouldn't be wanting this and that and get one thing. That UPS truck comes with that Amazon delivery and oh my, we're so happy to see it. And then eh, it's sold in a day or two. We're never content. You know, if we would be more content doing what we're supposed to be doing while on this earth, we could probably save a, a whole lot of money. Paul said in Philippians 1 verses 21 through 23, For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. But if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor, yet what I shall choose I want not. He's saying, if I live, I can do more work for the Lord, but I sure would like to go, for I'm in a strait betwixt two. Having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. 
He, he wanted to do some soul stepping. He wanted to be like Rachel as her soul departed her body. He wanted, he wanted to do some soul stepping there. He says, nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. But after his trip to paradise, he lived like a suicidal maniac. He didn't care about his life except for what he could do for the Lord while he was here. He took risk. He took risk with his own life so that he could point others to Jesus, so that he could go places, some of them places he was not supposed to go when he went, but nevertheless, the Lord allowed him some exceptions. Okay, go on, Paul, but my way would have been easier. But uh, anyway, he, he just lived like a suicidal maniac for the Lord. <laughs> Peter, Peter said in Second Peter 1, 13 through 15, Yea, I think it meet as long as I am in this tabernacle, this body, to stir you up by putting you in remembrance, knowing that shortly I must put off this my tabernacle, even as our Lord Jesus Christ hath showed. Moreover, I will endeavor that ye may be able to, after my decease, to have these things always in remembrance. Peter, Peter, didn't mind stepping out of his body either. He knew where he was going to be. He was going to be with the Lord. Uh, but he he lived to point others to Jesus. He wanted them to remember. His main concern was not his life, but taking others to heaven with him, like that of Paul. He wanted his followers, he wanted us to keep in mind everything we've been taught about our Lord in our future home. If you know Jesus, you do not have to be afraid of death. The only thing we should be concerned about is doing our part to make sure we take as many as we can with us when we go. After we are saved, we are left here to be ambassadors for Christ. When my time comes to depart from this world, I don't want my baby saying, Oh, why did he take my mama? Or why did he take my Grammy? If I go first, and if I go before the rapture, know this. He took me because he loves me and has something wonderful waiting there for his child that he just can't hardly wait to give me. He's like a parent who bought the Christmas gifts early and just can't wait to, till Christmas to give them. So if I go before you do, what I would want my loved ones most of all to do and to know is to join me there one day. Believe on Jesus and come. God said in Psalm 116 verse 15, Precious are the death of his saints. Isaiah 57, 1 and 2, The righteous and the merciful men are taken away. None considering that the righteous is taken away from the evil to come, he shall enter into peace. Let me give you some examples of this. Josiah was the good king of Israel who found the word of God after it had been hidden away for so many years. He read it to the people. He, he had everything destroyed that had anything to do with the idolatry the nation had been committing. He had all the altars to Baal torn down. He got rid of all the idols and perversions of the kings before him. But you know what? Even though the idols were gone, the hearts of the nation of Israel were still rotten. But God was pleased with Josiah. So he decided to just take him on home early. He didn't take him right then, but he took him earlier than he would have. Josiah was a good guy, so God killed him. <laughs> that don't sound right, does it? But if you read your Bible, you'll see it was. In Second Kings twenty two, nineteen through twenty, he says to to Josiah, Because thine heart was tender, and thou hast humbled thyself before the Lord, and hast rent thy clothes and wept before me. I also have heard thee, saith the Lord. Therefore, I will gather thee unto thy fathers, and thou shalt be gathered into thy grave in peace, and thine eyes shall not see all the evil which I will bring upon this place. God was going to punish Israel because of their idolatry, but God was going to take Josiah 
home. <laughs> God was going to allow Josiah to step out of that body and come on home. I guess Josiah was like Paul. Josiah, after that, lived recklessly, knowing something grand awaited him. He went out and fought in a battle that God had clearly let him know was not his to fight. But he went anyway, and he died in that battle and awoke in paradise. Um, Abijah. Abijah is another example of a good guy dying. Abijah, the son of King Jeroboam of Israel, was very sick. His wife was sent to ask a prophet if the child would live. 1 Kings fourteen twelve through 13 Abijah was not healed. Instead, the Lord gave them this message. The child shall die because in him is found some good thing toward the Lord of Israel. The kid's going to die because he's a good kid. I'm taking him. I'm taking him out of this rotten world. If you read the context, you'll see the Lord is saying, he's the only one good out of the whole bunch of you, and I'm taking him on to something better. Many times, <clears throat> the good guys are taken out first. Another good example is that before the horrible seven years of the tribulation, all Christians are going to be taken out, including those already in their grave. Do you have a loved one who has passed on? Think about, think about the words to this song I heard recently. The only scars in heaven, they won't belong to me and you. There'll be no such thing as broken and all the old will be made new. And the thought that makes me smile now, even as the tears fall down, is that the only scars in heaven are on the hands that hold you now. Hallelujah, hallelujah for the hands that hold you now. For your loved ones now in heaven, the only scars there in heaven won't belong to them. The only scars in heaven are on the hands that hold them now. After my daddy died, I was angry with God for a while. I thought he should have let him live. But God was the only one I could turn to for comfort even when I couldn't say, I love you, Jesus. <laughs> he was still the only one I could turn to for comfort. So as I stayed in his word and kept my eyes on Jesus, even while I was mad at him, he taught me so many beautiful, wonderful, comforting things. My YouTube channel was started to help share a few of those things with you. I, I wanted mostly to, to share them with my grandchildren, my children when I'm gone. They don't listen to them now, but <laughs> maybe one day they will. Um, I did get them, some of them to subscribe to it, though. Uh, <laughs> I, hope, I hope you'll join me on, on my YouTube channel and subscribe and share and help me to share God's beautiful words of life. Oh, they're so comforting. Jesus is so wonderful to know, and you can know him in a personal relationship. The important thing that I could have comfort about during my daddy's illness was that through the reading of his word was that I knew where my daddy was and that I'd see him again. Like Paul said, I am confident of that. I am confident. Do you know that about your loved ones and about yourself? If you were to die, do you have the assurance that you have a home in heaven? Paul said, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain, for I'm in a strait between two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. God said, precious in the sight of the Lord are the death of his saints. But he said in Ezekiel 33, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. We need to be busy telling people about Jesus. One way to do it is to share this with those you love and even with those you don't love. Revelation 22:17, And the Spirit and the bride say, Come, and let him that heareth say, Come. And let him that is a thirst come, and whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. We are the bride of Christ. God is confident we're telling people to come, and the Spirit and the bride say, Come, 
Are you doing your job? Won't you come to Jesus today and be saved if you haven't already? It's not by confessing specific sins because we don't even know what they all are until we get the Holy Spirit in us to show us. The, <clears throat> the way to know you have a home in heaven when you die is to know you are a sinner and something must be done with your sin. Jesus took care of it. He did the hard part. He paid our debt. Jesus told Nicodemus that as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, that he, Jesus, would be lifted up. The serpent represented the sins of the people of the world. And when Jesus was lifted up on that cross, the sins of all the people in the whole world were laid on him, including our sins. Jesus was telling Nicodemus that we must look to him to be saved. Jesus used the word believe over and over and over so we would understand whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. He that believeth on him is not condemned. To know you are a sinner and turning to Jesus in belief as the one who came and died and arose again, paying the price for your sin is what it takes to have a place in heaven when you die. Not just believing there is a Jesus, the devil believes that, but believing on him to be your Savior, the one who paid your sin debt. You do it with your will. I will believe. Jesus said to Martha, the sister of Lazarus, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Jesus said nothing in these verses of anything else needed in order to be saved other than belief on him. No water baptism, no good works, no confessing of specific sins, no sacraments, Nothing, nothing, nothing else but faith in Him and His finished work on the cross. Will you believe Him right now? Will you believe on Him and be saved? Will you believe He paid your sin debt? It's so simple. It worked for the thief on the cross. It worked for Martha. It worked for the Philippian jailer. It worked for me and for everyone who has ever realized they're a sinner in need of a Savior and turned to Jesus in belief as the one who paid their price for sin. Will you believe? Then to have the assurance of your salvation, read God's word, to live a happy, abundant life while on this earth, and to receive rewards in heaven rather than to lose them, follow his teachings. There's plenty of Christian stands to lose while we're on this earth and when we get to heaven at the judgment seat, <laughs> there's plenty we can lose if we don't uh, choose to follow our Lord's teachings. But salvation is not one of them. Once you're in the family of God, you're in his family for good. God bless you. I hope this, I hope this uh, lesson inspires you to, to go out and tell others. And I hope that one day you do some soul stepping out of that body into a beautiful, beautiful place. God bless you.